a number of years ago, a book by Rick Warren hit the uh, press and became a record-selling evangelical book that uh, gained national attention, uh, leading the uh, various uh, book lists, being at the top of the charts of these books. They, you may have heard the title before, The Purpose Driven Life, uh, a book which uh, Mr. Warren, or, uh, Pastor Warren uh, did not consider to be a self-help book. In fact, he tried to argue that this was not to be a self-help book. It was the very opposite of that. His intention was not to help you plan your ways and, and make uh, a more profitable life for yourself. Rather, it was to say that your life needs to be, if you will, God-helped, shaped by God's purpose for your life. And our only happiness it will be found in abandoning self and giving yourself over to God and His purpose for you. That's when you see what you were made for, why you were here, and what you need to be doing in the world around you. He highlighted five areas where he wanted to emphasize God's purpose for you. His purpose in worship, that you should be enjoying God. That should be the chief, in the words of our catechism, the chief end of uh, man. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so worship is at the heart of our relationship with God. That is God's purpose for you, that you should enjoy God. Uh, he also talked about the importance of discipleship. We need to be learning how to live before God and walk in God's ways and, and serve God in the world around us. Uh, he talked about the importance of uh, ministry, care for those who are in need, going out of the way to assist others. Then there was the idea of mission. We should be going out to reach those who are lost and bring them into Christ. And so these various uh, elements of God's purpose for you uh, were the, the outline of his book. And if you haven't read it, you ought to read it. It's well worth uh, the time to read that book and to reflect on it. And even if you had read it, read it perhaps years ago, it might be helpful to review it once more. What is God's purpose for you? How does God want you to live? Uh, I read as well a, a book of his called The uh, Purpose Driven Church. It applies similar principles to the life of the church and how the church ought to be governed by God's purposes and directed in that fashion. Uh, purpose is something that organizes our lives. If we understand our purpose, if we, if we have a vision for what we want to achieve or what we ought to achieve in life, then that can bring a certain synergy to our life, a certain uh, focus to our energies. We're moving in one direction rather than going all over the place, following this and following that, and in the end accomplishing nothing. Purpose is an important part of life. If you don't understand what your purpose is for living in general, then you're going to wander about aimlessly in the course of life. I hope that in the course of this message you will reflect on God's purpose for you and how you should be living your life before the Lord in this new year in this coming month, within each week, each day, each hour, each moment, what is God's purpose for me? What should I be endeavoring to achieve and accomplish at this point in my life, where I'm at with all my capabilities or what have you? How has God shaped me for this moment that I might live for God's purpose? The Apostle Paul was no stranger to purposeful thinking, to organizing, organizing his life around a, a major goal or aim. You recall uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul speaks of uh, his life in the terms of uh, uh, the athlete who, as a boxer, does not merely box in the air, just shadow boxing, but he uh, trains himself vigorously and disciplines himself so that he can be prepared for his boxing match. 
Uh, he is like the, the runner who runs his race with a, a, a specific aim before him to, to reach the end and to win the prize. There is an aim to his life. You may recall his uh, final letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, where he says, uh, Timothy, you were well acquainted with my faith, my purpose, uh, my conduct. Uh, he shared his aim for life, as the English Standard Version translates it, with Timothy. And so there was a certain uh, goal, mission, direction to his life that focused him. And that's uh, what he pursued. Of course, he had Christ meet him on the road to Damascus to tell him what his purpose was. You will bear my name before kings and princes, as you would do in Rome. Which is where he's writing uh, this epistle to the church at Colossae. He is a prisoner in Rome at the time. Now, the New International Version will have the word uh, Paul describing his purpose. This is my purpose uh, for you. The English Standard Version does not have that. Admittedly, the NIV takes a little bit of liberties in, in giving the intention of the Greek uh, grammar there without the specific words, my purpose for you. But it gives the thought there. Paul has a particular purpose with regard to his ministry to the church at Colossae. So that will govern what he writes to them, the way he relates to them, uh, what he wants to see happening in their congregation. He's a man guided by a purpose. Now, sometimes when we think of those who are purpose-oriented, we have this image of the, the man who's got his uh, calendar out and everything is written down, and if it does not fit into his daytime or into his schedule, uh, nothing is going to happen. It all works according to his schedule, and his life is somewhat dictated by that, and you might think well, he's rather robotic in the way that he conducts his life. It's just one step after the next, this is what I'm doing. Don't disturb me. Uh, Paul is anything but robotic in the way that he pursues his purpose before God. He conducts his purpose with great light, with great vigor, passion even, concern. And he opens this second chapter by mentioning his great concern for the people in Colossae and the neighboring cities, Laodicea, which we are familiar with from the book of Revelation, that church which eventually was uh, lukewarm, uh, Paul was concerned for the Laodiceans, the church at Colossae, and there was a third church right in that Lycus Valley uh, in the area of Herop, I believe that the city was Heropolis. And these three cities in the Lycus Valley were possibly cities that Paul had traveled through on his way to Ephesus. At the very least, when he engaged in his ministry in Ephesus, some of those from those communities perhaps came to hear him in Ephesus and went back to those cities with the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ and churches were planted there and established in Colossae and thereabouts. Paul, though he is now in Rome, was still nonetheless very concerned for these churches. He bore their interests on his heart. He was continually concerned for their spiritual well-being. Even though many, if not most, of the folks there he had never met personally, face to face. Uh, actually, the Greek is that he never met them in the flesh. And you find once more that this kind of emphasis of, of the Apostle Paul on the real physical, tangible aspects of the Christian life. This in the flesh correspondence and relationship which is so important for these Colossians who were so captivated by airy notions of spirituality and uh, mysticism that Paul wanted to kind of, as it were, grab these people who were floating about in the air and bring them down to the ground to reality and say, we relate to each other flesh to flesh, man to man, face to face. There's a reality here that needs to be appreciated. Perhaps we need to be 
be reminded of that today with our Facebooks and our YouTube and the email correspondence and the, the, the cloud where we put all of our documents in. Sometimes we need to be grounded in personal relationships, face-to-face -face relationships. That being said, Paul, at a distance from these folks, and not perhaps even knowing them personally, nonetheless had a real genuine care for these people. Their spiritual life was of utmost importance for him. No doubt he heard from Epaphras and others of the various folks who responded to the gospel, and he heard their stories of life, who they were, um, how they came to know the Lord, how God worked in their lives, and these stories uh, made him acquainted with them in such a way that he felt that they were personally connected to him. And he was concerned to hear about them. Perhaps you have friendship networks of people that you've never met yet face to face. I have that on uh, Facebook. There are a number of people that I've never met, but I've learned about them. And we communicate with each other and become quite somewhat acquainted as best as he can. But there's a real concern that Paul had, a pastoral heart for these folks. He says, I have an, a struggle on your behalf, and I want you to know about it. <laughs> Two things there. First, he does struggle. And the word is, uh, in the Greek, uh, the same word we get the English word agonize over. It's that word of um, uh, wrestling and, and uh, undergoing severe uh, struggle for, for these folks. So, Paul was deeply concerned for this congregation. It reminds us of the agony that Jesus underwent in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. At the same time, he went to his disciples and said, Watch and pray, because the flesh is weary. And Paul, being tied to a Roman soldier in his Roman cell, or his Roman home, uh, could not come to Colossae, could not teach them, could not uh, warn them against the false doctrines that were coming their way. So what could he do? The only thing that he could do, which was pray for these people, write to them, and be concerned for them. You may not be able to always take care of the ones you love. Your children, your grandchildren, perhaps they have grown up and moved on and they're living in different communities, maybe in different states, maybe in different nations. God sends our families all over the place. We have folks that are near and dear to us, but they are far apart. Sometimes the only thing that we can do for them, besides the occasional phone call or internet message, is to pray for them. And Paul describes this as a struggle on his part, on their behalf. We need to enter into that same kind of struggle in our prayer life for one another, for the church, for this congregation, for its ministry around this community and around the world. Pray, agonize in prayer. Pray for me, your elders. Pray for each member of the church. Pray for the elderly, that God would minister to each one. Pray for our children as well. But pray. Do not rely merely on the arm of the flesh, merely on your capacities and talents and so forth. Pray. Agonize in prayer for the advance of God's kingdom. Well, what is it that so motivates Paul that he would suffer for these people? He describes it that they, they might be encouraged or strengthened in heart. He was concerned for their inner spiritual well-being, for the strength of their hearts. We're always concerned about that in terms of our physical life. We take our walks, we do some exercise, we might uh, eat an apple a day, uh, care for our diet. We do the kinds of things to strengthen our heart, make sure we are healthy. Paul is concerned for the hearts of his congregation, not just their feelings, their emotions, how they feel about life and how uh, happy they are, that kind of thing, but most especially what they are thinking. 
what they were thinking about the world and themselves and their relationship with God, who God is and how He is relating to them. God wants them to think in their hearts in ways which are right and true. And that will have a major impact on the rest of their lives. As Proverbs tells us, out of the heart flow the issues of life. So Paul, in all of his ministry, had an aim, and that was the very core and center of our lives, our hearts. He seeks to address that which is at, 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 at if you will, the heart of their matter, that which is central to our being, our relationship to God, our walk with Him and with each other. So how our how are our hearts? Let's say that three times fast. How are our hearts strengthened by uh, Paul, by grace? Well, he uses a, a couple of images here to describe this work of strengthening the heart. And the first is that uh, this idea of knitting us together in love. Uh, I think the, the image that I have of knitting is my mom, uh, in, in the past, knitting sweaters for us as we were growing up, she would be sitting in the chair and I have an image of her with this round thing and knitting away with a, 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 a spool of yarn in front of her. And uh, from the, this uh, round spool of yarn, she would form a sweater or a blanket or something like that. Knitting it together, forming it, putting it together. Uh, that is the mission that the, the church has for us, that we are to be knit, woven together. We are to be integrated into each other's lives. We form a body together in Christ. The other way I think of this knitting together is of a body. Whenever, whenever you think that you, if you either look at yourself or you look at uh, uh, athletes and see the sinews of their arms and their chests, especially as they're engaged in some uh, athletic event, you see how their muscles are like the sinews that are knit over them, uh, interwoven. God forms and fashions our bodies in marvelous ways. The church, the people of God, are being knit together by Christ in love as He draws us together to one another. It's part of His great work in forming us as a united people of God. Remember, He said to His disciples before He passed that uh, they will know you are my disciples by your love. He encouraged the church to love one another. And that involves a certain measure of knitting together. We need to be involved at a certain level in each other's lives. Understanding where our weaknesses and strengths are, helping each other out, encouraging one another. Being knit together in love. This was part of Paul's mission, his purpose for the congregation. Uh, then he goes on to talk about not only being knit together in love, but... Uh, Deepening our understanding of God's mystery, which is Christ. There is a, a concern for Him that we appreciate the great riches that we have in Christ, in God's revelation in Jesus Christ. And so there is the social aspects of the work of the ministry in drawing us together in love. But they will be rooted in a, a common understanding of Jesus Christ. The riches, Paul says, of, of, of the fullness of understanding, the full assurance of understanding. Paul, again, as he is accustomed to doing, piles up words in understanding or in explaining this idea that we should know Christ. <clears throat> There's a richness in knowing Christ. There's an unfathomable richness in the work of Christ, exploring his person and work. Theologians have sought to... Uh, understand this great work over the centuries and they continue to pour into the scriptures and seek to unlock more and more of what the scriptures have to say about Christ and his work. Riches of understanding in Christ. We should be captivated by those riches. Uh, Jesus told the parable of the man who goes out into the field and finds a treasure in a field. 
and he sells all that he has that he might purchase that field and own that treasure. And Jesus really is pointing to himself. It's, he's talking about the kingdom of God there in Matthew chapter 13. But this treasure ultimately is Christ himself. The king. Knowing him is, is the most important thing in life. For which we should sell everything we have in order to know him. There's nothing more important than that. So Paul speaks of the great riches of the understanding of the full assurance that comes from understanding Christ. Now, he speaks of Christ as God's mystery. There's a certain uh, contrast of words here, a riches of understanding of a mystery. How do you understand that which is a mystery? A mystery is something that is hard at least to understand, if not impossible to understand. We say uh, the, perhaps the, the, the course of the stars above us is a mystery. It's hard to understand. There are certain mysteries in the way that God has made the world. They're beyond our understanding. How do we understand the mystery which is Christ? Well, it's not through the path of speculation, not through the path of reasoning our way to Christ. It's through God's gracious revelation. Paul's whole ministry is the revelation of this mystery of Christ. And in these words we're reminded that understanding Christ or knowing Christ is the product of God's work of revelation. It's in accord with God's purpose. God's predestinating purpose. He has a people in mind to whom he reveals this mystery. Not all are welcome to this. Christ in his conversation with the Pharisees raises the question, why is it that you don't understand what I'm saying to you? It's because you're not my people. You're not my sheep. The natural man will always look upon Christ as something of a mystery. They don't understand him. They'll try to speculate about him. They might go into a quest for the historical Jesus and pursue all different avenues, but they will never understand the mystery of Christ because it comes to those whom the Spirit reveals him. There needs to be this spiritual illumination. The work of the Christian ministry Preaching the gospel is to explain Christ and to make him revealed to the people of God. To the natural man, it will always be a weird, strange, confusing message. Or a message which they can understand in outward terms, but to them it is senseless and foolish. Paul wishes that the church be rooted in Christ and understand their relationship to Him. He goes on to explain this relationship to Christ. We are rooted in Him. That's the image of a tree rooted into the ground. We should have a certain uh, uh, anchor to our lives in Christ such that we are not going to be swayed or moved aside from the various winds of this world. We are rooted in Christ in our relationship to Him. And then he changes from an agricultural image to an architectural image. We are built in Christ. We are in the process of being built up in Christ, like a building uh, being constructed. And you see the walls rising up. I remember watching the Wegmans in Warrington being built as I sat in the sleepy showroom. <laughs> Cheryl was there as well. <laughs> you could see the cranes come in and, and all the workmen like little dots across this huge building, working away, and gradually, day after day, you saw the building arise until now you can go into the Wegmans and it's a wonderful shopping experience. <laughs> I'm getting carried away with the, the vision of all that food and all these wonderful things. <laughs> but that's the work of the Christian ministry as well. It's building you up like a building in Christ, rooted and founded in Christ. One more image is that uh, athletic image, the image of the soldier or the, 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 the athlete who's being strengthened for his work, for his service in Christ. And so you see, okay, 
Sylvester Stallone as Rocky in the gym, pounding away with the weights and Argh! I'm sorry, getting carried away. But being strengthened, made strong, that's part of the Christian ministry. That's our purpose here. That you be rooted in Christ, built up in Christ, strengthened in Christ, so that in every way you look at your life, agriculturally, architecturally, athletically, you are rooted, grounded, built up in Christ, strengthened in Christ. You see how Paul has everything circling around and focusing on Jesus Christ. That's at the heart of all that we have to say. Knowing Him, His redeeming blood, His new life, His regenerating power, His righteousness that guides and directs our lives, His will that instructs us in the way we are to live. Jesus Christ, and through Him, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What an amazing purpose Paul has in his ministry to the church. That's our ministry too. Preaching Christ. Him we proclaim. So what is your purpose? There are many purposes that we have in our employment, in our families, in our homes, our church, community. Many different purposes might define our lives. Our one guiding purpose should be to know Christ. Finding Him the treasures of wisdom and knowledge rooted in Him. There is no wisdom, there is no knowledge outside of Him. It's all in Christ. And so whatever activity you are engaged in life, in your job, your family, your church, your civil affairs, they all need to be rooted and grounded in Christ and informed by Christ. His wisdom, His knowledge, informs everything in life. And when you see that and grasp that, then your life will be transformed. You will be made new. You will be filled with the Spirit of Christ. And you will live a life of great thanksgiving. A rich life. A joyful life. A full and abundant life. Because you know God's purpose for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your will for us as revealed in scriptures to know Christ and in him to see the great riches of wisdom and knowledge that are found in him. We pray that your spirit would bless each one, that we would uh, follow Christ in all of life. We ask it in his name. Amen.